Welcome to Quantum Mechanics, a powerful framework for understanding the universe. Hi everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to revisit the square well and derive many of the properties that we've already determined from no, being able to solve for the explicit solutions of the square well, but from the from the structure of the Schrodinger equation itself without having to solve for the explicit solutions. Um, what's the point of that if we've already done it? Well, I want you to see that um, equations, this particular equation, has special structure that, that uh, enforces the nature of the solutions to, to behave in a certain way. Um, we've kind of seen this before, but before I keep talking and talking, let's um, Let's, let's get down to details of exactly what I mean. Okay. So, when we solved the time-independent Schrodinger equation for the square well, we showed directly that the energy levels were non-degenerate. That is, all the eigenvalues were distinct that the energy levels, or the eigenvalues, were all real and that the eigenfunctions were orthonormal. Now this sounds a little bit, well not, not just a little bit, but a lot like the spectral theorem at the end of chapter 1, where for a general self-adjoint operator, the eigenvalues were real and the eigenfunctions were uh, orthogonal. We can make them orthonormal through normalization. And we restricted ourselves to the non-degenerate case. Remember I talked about repeated eigenvalues and we could treat that case for self-adjoint operators and we still had the same result about real eigenvalues and a complete set of eigenvectors, but it was a bit more complicated. But in this case for the square well, we verify this directly. Okay, keep that in mind. I, and this, it, it is good to kind of look at this section and go back to the general abstract type of notation from um, chapter one. So, theorem four. I'm not going to go through this in any detail. This is one that says that the energy levels of the one dimensional square well are non degenerate. So, it's a proof by contradiction and uses the Schrodinger equation time-independent Schrodinger equation for the square well. I only mention, I highlight this because keep in mind that for the square well, the uh, region between 0 and A, the potential energy is 0. It's like a free particle, but in a finite, finite range. Okay, so, but I expect you to go through these the arguments because I am going to give you an exercise so we can prove this in the same way but where the Hamiltonian is not purely kinetic but it does have a, a non-zero potential energy term. Okay. Now this theorem 6 is really important. Um, and it's referred to as hermeticity. And I said earlier, you know, we have this this uh, tension between the term self-adjoint and uh, hermitian. You just have to get used to that. This is one area where, where this particular result is generally always referred to as hermeticity, but it's related to the self-adjoint um, properties that we derived earlier. So for this particular Hamiltonian, this is the Hamiltonian for the square well between 0 and A. We have this equality. Now, if you stare at this enough, this is a statement that this particular Hamiltonian is self-adjoint. Because we move the the Hamiltonian from the right to the left. Ah, uh, I forgot to say something very important. We're we uh, 
We're proving this for two arbitrary functions, alpha of x and beta of x, defined on 0 to a, which vanish at the endpoints and are twice differentiable. We need to differentiate them. Um, these are just uh, general vectors that, uh, like in the general vectors, we proved a um, self -adjoint, the self-adjoint uh, relation for the general case in chapter 1. So, sorry for neglecting that. That's what alpha and beta are. They're complex valued. But look, when we go from the right-hand side back to the left-hand side, it looks like we just move h around and take the complex conjugate off. If, this is what I want you to do, if you go back, we have, a, we have an inner product. It's uh, the integral of uh, phi star psi in a inner product between phi and psi. Um, go back to the definition of the, the general inner product and see that in this particular setting, this is the expression for uh, h being, this particular h being self-adjoint. Okay. This is a good exercise for you to go through because it's similar in spirit to when we prove that the momentum operator, h bar over i d by dx in one dimension, was self-adjoint. We used integration by parts. Here you're going to use integration by parts twice because, twice because, you have a d, uh, second derivative here. Okay, so go through this and check it. Good exercise in integration by parts. You can't be practiced enough in integration by parts. So this hermeticity result, theorem 6, self-adjoint. If we know that H of this form is self-adjoint in this sense, although, you know, we're just uh, using this property, we haven't referred to it as anything, it's easy to prove then that the eigenvalues are real, energy levels are real, and they are orthogonal. Now, here's the exercise. In the spectral theorem at the end of chapter 1, I had, using Dirac notation, a proof that the eigenvalues of a self-adjoint operator on a finite dimensional space, um, complex inner product space, the eigenvalues are real and orthogonal and can be made orthonormal. Go through, go back and look at those calculations and look at these calculations and you will see that they are exactly the same structurally. It's just a different form, a specific form for the operator H and the inner product. In the spectral theorem, it was abstract results. Okay, all comes from hermeticity, theorem six. Study that carefully. Okay, well, just like in the, in the earlier result, we can prove a hermeticity result in the case we have a Hamiltonian more general than square well, the um, kinetic energy part in operator form plus a potential. The same type of result holds. Uh, we need some assumptions on alpha of x and beta of x. And that's also left as an exercise I mean, these are, these are good exercises because you can just essentially mimic what I've already done and look at where the wrinkles are. And for that um, kinetic plus potential energy, you can prove the eigenvalues are real and orthonormal. Okay. So this is, a, this is a nice section, and I really urge you to pay attention to it and go back and study the analogy with how we prove these results in, a, in an abstract sense for the spectral theorem. Look at the hermeticity result and convince yourself that it's the same as 
the operator H being self adjoint, but in this partic very particular notation um, that's appropriate for the square root. Okay, a good place to stop, and you can see what the topic will be next time. So, see you then. Goodbye.